When you think of the great Betty Davis performances, which ones come to mind? You might think Dark Victory, in which Davis plays a young socialite diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor. There's now Voyager, which shows us two sides of Davis, both physically and emotionally. One of her most famous roles is that of the witty and talented Margot Channing in the 1950 masterpiece All About Eve, and there's her ghoulish, astonishing work in 1962's Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, opposite Joan Crawford. All four of these roles are richly drawn and engaging and frankly iconic, but in a career of so many excellent performances, it's weird to realize her best work merely netted Betty Davis Oscar nominations, while two of her arguably lesser performances actually won her the gold trophy. The part of Julie Marsden and Jezebel is the better one, but outside of die-hard Betty Davis fans, and of course, Oscar junkies like myself, how many actually remember the first role for which she won the Best Actress Academy Award? Joyce Heath in the 1935 drama Dangerous is a solid but mostly unremarkable character for Betty Davis that pales in comparison to the dynamic character she played in the previous years of Human Bondage. That's the role she should have won the Oscar for, so why did she win it for Dangerous instead? And how did she manage to beat in 1936 some truly considerable competition in the Best Actress category, namely Katherine Hepburn, who had won an Oscar recently for Morning Glory, and who was nominated again for her delicious, highly acclaimed turn in the romantic drama Alice Adams. In this video, I'm going to discuss the 8th Academy Awards, if it was really Betty Davis who named the award Oscar, and how Davis ultimately defeated Katherine Hepburn for her first of two Best Actress trophies. First, let's discuss the ceremony itself. The 8th Academy Awards took place on March 5, 1936 at the Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles and was hosted by Frank Capra, the previous year's winner for Best Director, for It Happened One Night. This was the second and final year that write-in votes were permitted. As I talked about in my last Early Days of Oscar video, Betty Davis's name was left off the ballot for Best Actress, and such an uproar was caused that Academy President Howard Estabrook made the announcement that Academy voters could write on the ballot his or her personal choice for the winner. And in 1936, for the one and only time, a write-in vote actually won an Oscar, A Midsummer Night's Dream, which didn't officially make it into the Best Cinematography category, got enough write-in votes for Hal Moore to take the prize. Imagine the chaos there would be today if write-in votes were still allowed. Maybe Tony Collette could have been an unofficial nominee for Hereditary. The 8th Academy Awards definitely had its share of controversy, namely that after the formation of the Directors Guild, its members that year joined with the Actors and Writers Guild to boycott the event, many in protest of the Academy's unwillingness to intercede on behalf of union demands. Thus, the ceremony didn't have as many famous faces as usual, Academy membership dropping from 600 to only 40, so studios sent their office staff, switchboard operators, and gophers in a last-ditch effort to fill the room. In 1936, we got a new category, one that would be fairly short-lived, Best Dance Direction, which was discontinued two years later, Best Art Direction went to Richard Day for The Dark Angel, Best Film Editing went to Ralph Dawson for A Midsummer Night's Dream, and Walt Disney won yet another Oscar for Three Orphan Kittens in the Cartoon Short Subject category. Despite its eight nominations, Mutiny on the Bounty became the last film to date to win only Best Picture and nothing else, Irving Thalberg collecting his trophy just months before his untimely death at age 37 from pneumonia. At $2 million, Mutiny on the Bounty was the most expensive film ever made up until that time, and the critical and commercial love for the movie was right there from the start. A whopping 12 movies were nominated for Best Picture that year, including Broadway Melody of 1936, David Copperfield, and Top Hat. Another nominee for the Top Award was The Informer, which is most notable for two things. It was the first film to financially benefit from an Academy Award, making its money back at the box office within days of its wins, and it was also the first film for which the great John Ford would win a Best Director Oscar. To date, Ford is still the person with the most Best Director trophies, with four he would later win for The Grapes of Wrath, 
How Green Was My Valley, and The Quiet Man, in the 1936 Best Director category, Ford beat out Henry Hathaway for The Lives of a Bengal Lancer, Frank Lloyd for Mutiny on the Bounty, and Michael Curtiz in a write-in vote for Captain Blood. His biggest competition here was probably Lloyd, since Mutiny on the Bounty won Best Picture and Academy voters clearly liked his work, awarding him the Best Director trophy twice before for The Divine Lady in 1930 and for Cavalcade in 1934. The Informer did very well at the ceremony that year, also winning Best Scoring, Best Adaptation for Dudley Nichols, who initially declined the award due to a dispute between the Writers Guild and the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, and Best Actor for Victor McLaughlin, who beat out Clark Gable, Franco Tone, and Charles Lawton, all for Mutiny on the Bounty, plus Paul Muni for Black Fury in a write-in vote. McLaughlin gives a terrific performance in the film about an Irish rebel in 1922 who informs on his friend and then later regrets the decision, but McLaughlin most likely won this prize due to the three actors from Mutiny on the Bounty splitting the vote. Now it's time to talk about that year's extraordinary Best Actress race, filled with great talents top to bottom. Before we discuss how Betty Davis beat Katherine Hepburn for the award, let's look at the other nominees. First up is Elizabeth Bergner in Escape Me Never, a drama about a married composer who has a fling with an heiress who is engaged to his brother. This was the film's only Oscar nomination, and it was also the only Oscar nomination for the Austrian-British actress Bergner, whose acting career began in Berlin and Paris before she moved to London to make films. After Escape Me Never, she went on to appear in the 1936 film As You Like It and the 1970 horror film Cry of the Banshee opposite Vincent Price. Bergner could also be considered the inspiration for All About Eve, as reportedly she relayed an experience about working in the theater to the writer Mary Orr, who then wrote the short story that gave birth to Eve Harrington, the iconic character from the classic 1950 Joseph L. Mankiewicz film starring Betty Davis. Yes, in some small way, apparently Davis and Elizabeth Bergner had another connection than the Best Actress Race of 1936. Next up is Merle Oberon, who was nominated for her performance in The Dark Angel about a woman who accepts a marriage proposal from one of her two childhood friends while the First World War threatens to change their lives forever. The Oscar winner for Best Art Direction and a nominee for Best Sound Recording, The Dark Angel was a very popular film that year at the box office, especially in Britain. Andre Senwald in the New York Times saying, Oberon plays her role with skill and feeling. Oberon's star status in Hollywood took off after she was cast in the small but prominent role in 1933's The Private Life of Henry VIII opposite Charles Lawton. The Dark Angel was Oberon's only Oscar nomination in a prolific career that lasted almost 50 years, her most famous role likely being that of Kathy in 1939's Wuthering Heights. The third nominee for the 1936 Best Actress Oscar to discuss is Miriam Hopkins. Oh, Miriam Hopkins, an actress who collaborated with Betty Davis on two projects and whom Davis had a few choice words about late in her career. Right. Were there, were there, uh, you don't have to name them, were there others along the way who no. you worked with for the first time that disappointed you? No, 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 no. Most, at, we all really get along, honestly. Way back a hundred years ago, there was an actress, Miriam Hopkins, who was impossible. Why was that? She is the most incredibly inconsiderate woman I have ever worked with. Except years ago, Miriam Hopkins mm -hmm. was impossible, and all of us thought so. The two actresses worked together on 1939's The Old Maid and 1943's Old Acquaintance. How fitting that Hopkins would receive her one and only Oscar nomination in a year going up against Davis. She was nominated for the title role in Becky Sharp about an ambitious woman from a family of entertainers who strikes out on her own during Napoleon's Waterloo campaign. Becky Sharp is a landmark in cinema for being the first feature film ever to use the newly developed three-strip Technicolor production throughout, opening the way for more color films in the years to come. Outside of working with Betty Davis a couple of times, Hopkins is best known for 1931's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, 1932's Trouble in Paradise, and 1949's The Heiress, which won Olivia de Havilland the Oscar for Best Actress and netted Hopkins a Golden Globe nomination 
for Best Supporting Actress. But these days, her fights with Betty Davis might be what made her most famous of all, their battles well publicized and legendary. Between the time they worked together, Hopkins believed Davis was having an affair with her husband, Davis resented her jealousy, and often said she greatly enjoyed shaking Hopkins over and over during a scene in Old Acquaintance. Press photos featured the two divas in a boxing ring, gloves up, with director Vincent Sherman between them acting like a referee. Hopkins' last major roles in film were in the 1960s in The Children's Hour and The Chase. Next, we have to talk about Claudette Colbert, who had just won the Best Actress Oscar the year before for It Happened One Night, beating Betty Davis in a write-in vote for Of Human Bondage, and here she was back again, nominated for her performance in Private Worlds. Yep, it was Colbert versus Davis again, but this time, Colbert didn't have a movie nominated that was nearly as popular. Private Worlds is a drama that tells of a progressive female psychiatrist and her colleague at a mental hospital who go up against a conservative new supervisor. The film ultimately lost money at the box office, and the only nomination it got was for Colbert, so clearly she was heavily liked by the Academy at the time, but not enough for that rare double victory across two consecutive years. This wasn't the case, alas, of her movie winning picture, director, actor, screenplay. All that helped carry her to a win in 1935. In 1936, she was contending with much stiffer competition, five other official nominees this time, instead of just two, including the incredible Katherine Hepburn giving yet another excellent performance, and Betty Davis, who many felt was already overdue for an Oscar victory. Both actors were in many ways the Meryl Streep of their day, giving one tremendous performance after another and getting Academy Award nominations left and right. Hepburn ended her career with 12 nominations, and Davis ended hers with 10, 11 if you count the write-in votes for Of Human Bondage. Hepburn and Davis actually squared off in the Best Actress category three more times after this one. In 1941, Hepburn for The Philadelphia Story, and Davis for The Letter. In 1943, Hepburn for Woman of the Year, and Davis for Now Voyager. And in 1963, Hepburn for Long Day's Journey Into Night, and Davis for Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Not that the two cross paths very often, especially not at award ceremonies. Hepburn might still hold the record of most acting Oscar wins with four, but she never attended the Oscars in a year she was nominated and only came once to deliver a speech about a friend of hers. Let's face it though, Katherine Hepburn and Betty Davis did compete when it came to the Academy Awards and their first face-off took place in 1936 for Best Actress. The award, I would argue, was going to be presented to one or the other, which person was it going to be? Let's talk about Hepburn first, whose astonishing talent never wavered throughout her many decades as a film actress, but as I talked about in my video about the six Academy Awards, the status of Hepburn's Hollywood career definitely had its ups and downs, especially in the 1930s when enough of her movies underperformed and she became considered box office poison. After a strong start with Little Women and Morning Glory, the latter film earning Hepburn her first Oscar for Best Actress in 1934, Hepburn made some flops like The Little Minister and Break of Hearts. Many of her other films later in the decade underperformed too, but a rare hit for Hepburn at the time, both critically and commercially, was 1935's Alice Adams, about a working class girl who struggles to climb the social ladder with interference from her family, especially her unstable father. Now what can have been in Cook's mind not to have made an aspic instead of a heavy entree for weather like this? I'm afraid we let the servants do too much as they like about the meals, Mother. Perhaps we should uh, change les domestiques, n'est-ce pas? The film made Hepburn a public favorite again, Alice Adams making a sizable profit, Pauline Kael later calling the film a classic, and stating that Hepburn gave one of her two or three finest performances. I would say Katherine Hepburn had a pretty good chance in winning the Best Actress Oscar for Alice Adams because the Academy loved her and her film managed the Best Picture nomination, something that didn't happen for any of that year's other Best Actress nominees. Now you could say Hepburn didn't stand a chance simply because she had already won two years before, but in the 1930s, actors winning multiple prizes in quick succession happened all the time, as we'll get into in some upcoming early days of Oscar videos, in the late 1930s, the Academy awarded Louise Rayner Best Actress for two consecutive years, 
and they also awarded Spencer Tracy Best Actor for two consecutive years. So while Hepburn had taken the Oscar for Morning Glory, she still absolutely had a shot for Alice Adams. The film's Best Picture nod would have made another win for Hepburn very possible, even a likely outcome. And if Betty Davis hadn't been a contender that year, there's no doubt in my mind Hepburn would have coasted to a second Oscar victory. Actually, it's a given because final results were announced for some categories in the 1930s, and Hepburn did indeed come in second place for Best Actress that year. So why did Hepburn lose to Davis? What was so great about the performance Davis gives in 1935's Dangerous? The strange answer is that, well, there's actually nothing that great about her work in the film. She's solid as always, but it's not one of her more memorable performances, and certainly in a career of so many landmark roles, it's not one you'd expect to have actually taken the gold trophy. Dangerous tells of an alcoholic actress who finds rehabilitation, but then proves she has a dangerous side that can't be ignored. Sorry, but I'm, I'm too tired to be hysterical and my, my feet are much too sore from going barefoot to stand the job dancing over the cliff. Betty Davis originally turned down the script, not seeing much of a character to play, but Warner Brothers studio production chief Hal B. Wallace convinced her to reconsider, telling her she could make something special out of the character. Francho Tone, who also received an Oscar nomination at the 8th Academy Awards for his performance in Mutiny on the Bounty, was borrowed from MGM to be the male lead of Dangerous, and Davis was immediately drawn to him, despite his being engaged at the time, to Joan Crawford. Producer Harry Joe Brown later said he walked in on Davis and Tone in a compromising position and that Crawford knew about it but refused to break the engagement. Many biographers have suggested this incident was the start of their famous feud that would carry into the production of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane and Beyond. Dangerous received mixed reviews from critics, the New York Times writing, except for a few sequences where the tension is convincing, Davis fails in her performance, and Variety writing, Davis's performance is fine on the whole, but has a few imperfect moments. So yeah, there wasn't much excitement for the movie, or for Davis this time around, so why the hell did she win the Academy Award? Well, if you happen to watch my last Early Days of Oscar video, Claudette Colbert vs. Betty Davis, let's just say there was a lot of outrage about Davis being passed over the year before for an Oscar nomination for Of Human Bondage, which many considered the finest female performance ever put on film. And so I'm pretty sure Davis could have given an average to good performance in pretty much any movie the following year and still won the Academy Award, which she did for Dangerous. Davis herself considered her first victory in the Best Actress category nothing but a consolation prize for what had happened the year before with Of Human Bondage, and she felt Katherine Hepburn should have won for Alice Adams instead. It's happened so many times since that inevitable consolation prize, especially for actors who've amassed a ton of Oscar nominations without a victory. Think Geraldine Page finally winning an Oscar after eight nods for The Trip to Bountiful, and Al Pacino finally winning an Oscar after eight nods for Scent of a Woman, and then think about Glenn Close finally winning an Oscar after eight n Oh wait, scratch that one. But yeah, back in 1936, there was a lot of love for Betty Davis, for the great work she was doing in movie after movie, and for her remarkable turn in Of Human Bondage that didn't get officially recognized by the Academy the year before. So Katharine Hepburn and all the others nominated for Best Actress were going to have to sit this ceremony out, leaving Betty Davis the winner. The presenter of Best Actress, D.W. Griffith, reportedly said to Davis at night, You don't know how lucky you are, young lady, at your age, to be where you are, making all that money, fame, and everything. Very pleased. Everybody who voted for me in the Academy, and all the people all over the country who have wished this year that I would get it. Davis nodded to the man, and she put on a happy face when she collected her trophy, no matter her feelings about why she earned it. And what did she do next? She walked out of Warner Brothers the very next day and demanded better scripts before she'd return to work. As we reach the end of this video, we also have to ask the question, was it Betty Davis that named the Academy Award an Oscar? There have been conflicting reports for years. Davis has claimed that the name derived from her observation that the backside of the statuette looked like that of her husband at the time, Harmon Oscar Nelson. Some doubt this story, because why would she go with her husband's middle name 
as opposed to Harmon or Nelson. By all accounts, there are two other people who might have given it the name of Oscar. First, Academy librarian Margaret Herrick, who at one point remarked that the statuette looked like her uncle Oscar. And second, LA gossip columnist Sidney Skolsky, who felt the ceremony was too self-important and started calling the trophy an Oscar in his writing to refer to Oscar Hammerstein Sr., a man often the butt of jokes from vaudeville comedians. So there's not a definitive answer. I like to believe it was Betty Davis who came up with it, since her name was so synonymous with the Oscars for so many decades. Believe what you want to believe, no matter who came up with it. At the end of the day, Davis did win two Oscars in her spectacular career in film, the first for Dangerous, a consolation prize, let's face it, and the second, just three years later, for the costume drama Jezebel. But more on that Best Actress victory, and so much more on the incredible Betty Davis in the months to come. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and let me know in the comments below who you think should have won Best Actress at the 8th Academy Awards. Was Betty Davis the right choice, or should Katherine Hepburn have taken this one? See you next time!